All right, good evening, everybody. Thank y'all for coming uh, to the October case review. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about PAI uh, in detail, but we're going to kind of change it up as we've been trying to do is change things where it's not the same, you know, you're getting just a whole hour of nothing but listen to me talk, or you may have something, uh, you know, we may have a guest speaker like it'll be next month. Uh, but this month we're going to have a little bit of mixture, of a little bit of education, just a little bit in there, and then a lot of crews getting up and talking with Dr. Troutman about their PAI. Uh, and guys, none of these are bad calls. All of these are great learning situations that the crews did a great job managing what they had to manage at the time. And so we want to talk about some of the benefits of PAI, some of the uh, things that may not be so beneficial during PAI, and then Dr. Troutman has some of his teaching points to... Uh, <clears throat> to finish up each uh, session. So tonight, uh, as meeting state requirements, this will be one hour for medical or uh, one hour for airway breathing and circulation for National Registry, uh, depending on what you are. And once again, I'll put those in. Uh, and if you, anybody's uh, getting ready for in March for research, uh, you will have, uh, if you've logged in so far, if you could log in pretty soon, let me know, get with me, and make sure you can see the classes. I've got some that can't see the classes at all, and I've got some that can only see part of them. I think I looked at our data, I don't think I could. Okay, so you're one of those. So it's a computer glitch on the National Registry side, so we'll get that moved forward. Okay. <coughs> so some of our objectives today, first of all, we want to talk about several cases uh, where patients were uh, assessed and treated and needed, you know, not the typical intubation. Uh, then we want to review some of the medications used during PAI and we want to also examine the post-intubation needs uh, and some of the things that uh, Dr. Trout will probably touch on some of the things coming uh, with, uh, open, with a PAI uh, in the very, very near future. Okay, so Dr. Ballin, he's going to show you just yeah, how good he is. Just to catch you up, we started a needle crack on the cell and put it right at the end of the needle crack on the cell. He does have lidocaine on board, just... back down. Can you back it up just a little bit where he actually sings a little bit so you can see what those vocal cords will do? Next month, the nice thing is, Dr. Trout is going to come in and demonstrate this uh, with just a King Vision only for everybody. Okay. That's got to be you that he is in the right airway once again. There we go. Look at this piranha. All right, so just a little, just a little video. We came across that and I kind of went, 
Oh, goodness. He uh, really did that. So I thought that's worth showing. And we talked to Dr. Troutman once again. He's graciously agreed to uh, next month give it a try for us. Um, so, guys, one of the biggest things with PAI is we've got to make sure that our benefits outweigh our risk. Okay? Our benefits outweigh our risk. You know, we get on this scene or we get this scene just on a medical call. We had to throw this in. Dog got to hold the porcupine. You know, that's got to be a rough uh, time getting down. But guys, we know at this point, my benefit is going to be a lot better than the risk that it's going to be for tubing and not tubing. Some of the most important things to remember is you're betting that patient's life that you're going to get them to. I say that again, you're betting that patient's life that, on your skills. So I've got to make sure that if I'm taking that airway, guys, if you're on the other side of Clayton or you're coming from Abernathy or you're coming from out in the county, guys, it'll look a long time to bagging somebody filling the gut up with air if I can't get them to. So we've got to talk about our backup airways, our surgical cracks and what we have. So let's, let's, let's size this up. Where are we at? Successful intubation rate for UMCMS, 94% overall with PAI, 96%. Now, I need a little work right here in the very beginning side, 65% on first time attempts and 56 on uh, first time on PAI. So that's telling us that we're, we're, we're getting it, but it's just we're having to work a little bit to get there. As far as the national averages, this is as of 2012, 85% total is what the national average is, 93% with uh, PAI. So it kind of, you know, it kind of is a little bit disturbing. You know, typically your, your codes ought to be pretty much your easiest tubes, you would think. Uh, but a lot of times, um, with PAI, they're, they're a lot more successful. So that kind of tells you how we stack up to the national average right now. So I think that's important that we know where we are. Okay, so first of all, we have uh, Dr. Troutman and... This is Andrea Colpitz. Andrea Colpitz, and neither one of them are here. Okay, well, I'll talk about it if you want to... Yeah. Okay. So uh, they get called for a uh, breathing difficulty. Patient states uh, that he has COPD. He's been having trouble breathing this morning. Uh, patient states that uh, he's done several breathing treatments uh, and has had no relief. And so you you already know this. This you've seen this a thousand times. They sit at home and he's trying. You know, he's keeps getting worse and worse. And he's trying his own breathing treatments. And uh, so we find him in a tripod position. Uh, with the nebulizer treatment being given by LFR. Uh, so why is this important? I wanted that highlighted because what's the difference between their or ours and the patient's? What are we mixing with ours? Oxygen, 100% O2. It's a big factor here because they're providing 100% oxygen when he hadn't been getting that at home. Patient's respiratory rate appears to be about 40. Patient's lung mass sounds are diminished in the lower lobes. Strong pulses, uh, skin is a little diaphoretic, um, and he appears in distress. So next one, they, they bring it up, they start to get CPAP, uh, they get him to the unit we talked about, and we get uh, CPAP on him uh, with no improvement. The patient is still breathing about 40 times a minute, saturations are now 79. What did we talk about? LFR has already been providing 100% O2, we've been providing 100% O2, and we're still at 79, so where did we start? probably a lot worse. Now, COPD knowing that he's going to tolerate that a little bit better than the average Joe because he lives probably a little hypoxic all the time and a little hypercarbic. Um, so he's, uh, they have been, uh, they're on three dual nebs right now with no success and no change. Patients continues uh, to decrease. Finally, they just make the decision to intubate. As soon as they get him to intubate, they see here his airway, saturation is going to 98% with the ET tube. Uh, lung sounds are still diminished on the left side, and tidal CO2 um, uh, decreased, and the patient remains stable. So as you can see, now what are we, you know, we're taught if we we're hypertensive and respiratory, we, we kind of buy off on that congestive heart failure side. But you know, this is one of those that he was just working real hard, so original saturation is 59. We get down and this is on the nasal. They did a great job getting him on nasal cannula quickly. Uh, so we have nasal cannula and tidal CO2 waveform, which looks absolutely horrible. And so you're kind of going, you know, he's, he's in bad shape. 
We continue on, uh, we get him intubated, saturations come up nicely, end titles are coming down 20, 30 points, which should be normal. And now we have a nice uh, waveform because we have a sealed tube in and we've got multiple dual nebs on board. Very unusual to see this correction that quickly with your end titles. Sometimes that may take days to fix that. So don't get frustrated and saying, hey, I'm pouring these, I'm pouring these dual nebs to him and it's, you know, I'm not seeing a change in my end title. You may not do that for a little while. Once again, they intubate him. They use a very nice size tube. Guys, bigger is always better. So uh, they get an 8.0 tube in now um, at 25. We've got bilateral breast sounds and then continue the dual nib treatment. Post intubation, post -intubation sedation. Um, we use Versed here. And Dr. Trotman's gonna to touch on uh, why some other drugs may be a little bit better there in that situation coming up for us. Uh, once again, they have to give him a little bit more Versed. Um, going on, you know, he's very hypertensive here. So they give one dose and about 10 minutes later, he's eaten through. So we're giving him another round of Versed. Awesome. Let's stand up. So pretty good case, pretty straightforward case that we see, right? Fortunately, a lot of these COPDers we get turned around with the CPAP. One thing on here, you notice we kind of got that CPAP going relatively quickly. I didn't look at the times, but remember, when that patient needs that CPAP, they need it 20 minutes ago. So let's try to get that on right away. When, whenever it enters your mind, hey, they need CPAP. Get that sucker on. Quicker is better. It's going to give them better time to hopefully not have to end up intubated uh, like this person did. Um, so ketamine, we've been using it for our people that are a little, uh, giving our hair, making our hands full in the field, right? Uh, so we're gonna start using that a little more for other things, one of those being intubation. Um, so ketamine is great for reactive airway disease. Does anybody know why? What's ketamine do aside from sedation? It actually dilates bronchioles a little bit. That's what this patient or bad asthmatic, that's the problem they're having, right? So ketamine is a great choice for somebody like this. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't really say it's a standard. It's not necessarily if you don't use ketamine, it was wrong. But generally, somebody like this get intubated in the ER, generally most folks are going to use ketamine. Keep in mind, like with this patient we did Versed, remember you can put a little fentanyl with that too, get that synergistic effect, especially if you're still having them try to wake up or bump the tube or something with just the Versed. So the bigger, bigger is better, right? So on endotracheal tubes. In my residency program, we actually had a contest. And it was like the last month, the biggest anybody dropped was a 10, and we had a 10 and a half, and I actually got it in this old COPD guy. Not advocating that we should go out and file these big tubes and have a contest. It probably was borderline inappropriate to do that. But it's really not. It's actually the bigger the tube, the much better for COPD folks. Um, it's easier to be able to put a bronch down to look around if they need to. And you can imagine if you try to breathe through a very tiny straw or a much bigger straw, those bigger straws are much better. And everybody in here is look down someone's throat, some people's throats are much bigger, and if it'll accommodate a bigger tube, how <coughs> to use the bigger tube. What's the largest we carry, is it eight? Nine. 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 So, you know, not a bad idea. If it is that, just like this guy's got a really big throat, go for that eight and a half or nine. Have that seven and a half or eight ready though, because it's not gonna fit on every patient. Um, you know, obviously we get down to like a 602, that's pretty small, especially on one of these COPD people, we're gonna have, they're gonna have trouble ventilating those. They're probably gonna end up getting the tube switched out, um, if not in the ER, in the ICU, to try to get a bigger tube, at least a seven and a half size. I want to comment on our PAI rates or percentages. You know, our overalls are pretty darn good, as you saw the national averages. You know, somewhere there in the mid 90s, so we meet that. Our first pass, I wish it was better. You know, certainly I can see a goal pushing 80%. That's what most folks go for is first pass success rate about 80%. Um, ours looks not that great. I don't know why we have a difficult time that first time, but we tend to get it the second time. So that's good. I'd much rather it be that than we can't get it the first time, can't get it the second time. And you know, we have an overall rate of 57%. That would be really, really bad. Um, 
you know, we PAI, we've done how many years of UMC and that's been knocking people down. Some of the older guys have to. For, I mean, if you always, at least 20, yeah, 20 plus year. years. And, you know, that's, uh, I think nationally, I bet less than 50% of EMS services actually do uh, give paralytics in the field. Um, so, you know, it's certainly an, like, an honor that we get to do that, but it is true. It's a big deal. You're essentially betting that patient's life because, as you know, you give them that paralytics, they're not breathing anymore for a little while. So it's all on you to establish that airway. So something we have to take very serious. Um, we actually just about two weeks ago started PAI in Amarillo. They have never done that. Um, so they have done four, and they are four for four on first rate, first time passes. So we have to start a little contest here so you can keep the best numbers up. So, all right, <coughs> on the next case. Okay. This was at Carillon, and we got there it's right after shift change, and they said they'd come in and check on the patient, and she wasn't acting normal. Said somebody had mentioned that she fell over the weekend, and that ever since then she had been acting abnormal. Um, and it's hard for me to remember exactly how she was acting, but I believe her GCS was pretty low initially, but she still had some purposeful movement at times, like if we would ask her to move her hand or she'd make eye contact with you a little bit every now and then. So it, I thought that would be purposeful. Um, we load her up, she's maintained her airway well. Everything was great until we got in the unit, uh, dismissed, fire, because we were gonna, we were at Carillon, so we were just gonna transport her and get her to the hospital. As Soon as we dismissed them and got ready to go, Got her on the monitor and she started posturing real bad. And at that point, we decided to intubate her, PAI. So, what were you thinking was going on? Uh, head injury. Because right. they said she'd fallen and just not acting right. Yep. Um, so, we lidocaned her, RSI her, and transported her from there. It's pretty simple, straightforward after that. So, lidocaine. I think that's the next slide, kind of talk about lidocaine. So we typically give lidocaine for suspected <coughs> head injury, right? Why? What's the lidocaine do theoretically? Decrease the Right. And it was pretty much kind of this one-off study that even found that. It really hasn't been really well studied on does lidocaine work or not. Um, it's not really necessarily a standard of care. It's if you don't give lidocaine, it's not that you did wrong. Most places are gonna kind of base it on what their neurosurgical department prefers. Here they prefer we give lidocaine for any suspected head injury. The, there's not a lot of evidence. Yeah, I've mentioned, I think it's one one-off study. Is it on the next slide? Right there. Oh yeah, there was this one study that said, you know what, it might help. The bigger thing is, it just doesn't do a lot of bad things. You know, it's kind of like, Give a Narcan, if somebody's altered, eh, try some Narcan, see what happens. Give them a little lidocaine before you intubate. Really has never shown to cause any problem. So that's all we tend to do it. Because, you know, if somebody's got a head bleed, their ICP's up a little bit, any little decrease potentially could keep it low enough where we don't get to that point where we're herniating and causing irreversible damage to the brain stem or something. Go back, what was the other? That was the main key. Yeah, absolutely. You know, great decision on, you know, it sounded like when we first saw the patient, it was, eh, you know, maybe a little altered, but you know what, let's let's not take your airway. Let's let's roll with this. Maybe it's been going on a couple days, and I don't know why, if it was if it's been the patient movements, the bleeding increased or what have you, and next thing we know, we're posturing. Now, obviously, we're at a, a GCS less than eight intubate, right? So we're definitely lower now. Now we're really worried about them protecting their airway. So we moved swiftly on taking that patient's airway and went uneventful. Cool. Good job. So basically put the crew into a position where they, they had to do, they had it. And they made the decision, hey, let's transport. And then they get kind of pushed into, so the patient pushed them into that position where they had to take that airway to secure it. So definitely one of those. They did a very nice job. And just the drive home point here is make sure if you're suspecting a head, whether it's traumatic head or non-traumatic head, so you're talking about a CBA, a possible bleed, lidocaine is definitely indicated here, okay? What's normal ICP should be? Anybody know off the top of your head on a bolt pressure? Do what? 
seven, eight, below 10, okay? A lot of times is what the study showed is that it can drop it up to about 12 millimeters of mercury. Uh, with This was a study with patients with tu uh, tumors in the brain. So that's a lot of ICP that they just took off there. So, you know, once again, our neurosurgical department wants this done here, so that's what we follow. And just remember, you know, why do we worry about intracranial pressure? You know, your brain or your skull, your <coughs> cranial vault, it's a fixed position, right? Brain's in there and fluid, got the meninges around it, kind of suspends it. So when we have increased fluid and typically we think of traumatic blood, then that blood's got to go somewhere, right? Your heart's going to pump that blood in there. The brain is a little squishy. That's a good scientific word, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be pushed whenever you have blood go into there. And then as you increase that pressure, the intracranial pressure increases, there's these tentoriums, I call them. They're more or less fibrinous areas around the brain that kind of lays around and suspends it. And when we have that pressure, you can actually, the brain pushes against or pushes down to the foramen magnum. That's what this herniation is that we hear, or hear about and worry about. And it's, it's so problematic because that's all right around the brain stem. You know, the brain stem is the thing that you know, makes us breathe. It's the, it's the uh, I don't know to say unhuman, but it's the, it's the, it really is, it's the unhuman part. It's the part, the cerebellum, cerebrum, is what makes us talk and move our hands and what have you. That brain stem is what makes us breathe, regulates our blood pressure, etc. So you start putting pressure on that, those things go south. And anytime you, you, if I lay a brick on my finger long enough, my finger dies, right? So whenever you put that pressure on the brain stem, that part of the brain is gonna die. And you take out their breathing apparatus or their nucleus that controls their diaphragm, they're never gonna breathe again on their own. So that's where a lot of that ICP becomes so important. You know, we have an open head injury, you know, depending on to what extent that is, you may not see the ICP increase, you may not see the pupillary changes because the blood has a place to go. And an open injury, obviously an open school injury is never a good thing, but sometimes it's actually not a bad thing when you have a little break there because there is a place for that blood to go and you, know, you don't raise that ICP because that's what really gets a head injury patient, that increased ICP. We got sent to a residence uh, about a week and a half ago or so. Um, elderly female. Uh, the family said she just wasn't acting right. Said she'd been having some trouble to breathe that day, but nothing was really strange. Um, they said that the grandson had been with her all day. He finally realized after her nap that she wasn't really waking up like she usually does. So they called us. So we got on scene. We found her um, having respiratory distress, rapid respiration, is very shallow. Um, she was unable to breathe very well. Um, she was responsive to verbal stimuli. She would follow you with your eyes and she would follow some commands, um, but not great. Um, she wasn't alert and up and able. She was kind of laying on her side and kind of lethargic. Uh, we immediately placed her up on a CPAP. Um, she didn't get on a non breather or anything. Uh, listen to her lung sounds and she was just completely full of fluid. Um, very, very coarse crackles in all lobes. Uh, she had an initial SPO2 of like 74% or something like that. It was pretty low. Um, we got her moved over to the truck and got her out to the truck. Um, she had no expiratory wheezing. Uh, we didn't, well, we had, excuse me, we did have some expiratory wheezing, so we went ahead and placed her on a duoneb and that, uh, corrected that issue. Her SPO2 began to increase, um, but uh, her level of consciousness began to decrease uh, ever so slightly. She just would stop responding to verbal stimuli, she wouldn't follow <laughs> command, she wouldn't do anything like we were supposed to do. Um, that's when we decided, decided to make, uh, the in, decided to intubate her. Um, she was pretty altered to start out with. Um, she really didn't have much of a response. Um, we placed her, uh, uh, we did the CPAP, or the PAI procedure, we started out with uh, Tomidate and followed with Versed. Um, she, I didn't have a very good history on her. The family wasn't very helpful. The grandson on scene didn't tell me much about her, uh, that he knew she had high blood pressure and diabetes. But she really kind of looked like a, uh, um, a, a renal patient. So we elected not to use her succinylcholine on her, um, just for the fear that she was potentially going to uh, dump a lot of potassium. Um, so we did that. Uh, it was the second attempt um, intubation. We got her successfully intubated. Um, started her on end titles. Um, everything was clear there. Um, her end titles were very high, up in the 90s, I think. Um, uh, we had good breath sounds. They continued to uh, get better with our intubation. We placed the P 
peep valve onto the side of the BVM. That really helped our breast sounds improve. Um, that was a huge help. Um, it, it made all the, all the difference in um, her oxygenation. We got a good SpO2. Um, we continued to sedate her with fentanyl. Um, she really didn't show many signs of pain, but we just kept her down. Gave her two more doses of fentanyl and kept her down. Um, her SpO2 at 78 was probably the lowest we saw. Um, we got a blood gas after we went back to the hospital the next time it was 115 on her uh, CO2, so it was pretty elevated. Um, that's about it. Awesome, good job. So, kind of talked about last time, and again, we got the CPAP on this patient pretty quickly. Um, so what's some endpoints? When, when do we go like, okay, the CPAP's not working? How do we make that decision? How'd y'all make that decision? Um, she wasn't able to hold her head up. Um, she wasn't able to make that decision to to keep her head up. She, I mean, she if she was able to hold her head up and could like blink and look at me, I would have given her the okay to stay on it because she was maintaining a pretty good SPO2 on the CPAP, um, but she just wouldn't respond at all. She was laid over, you could call her name, you could rub her chest, do anything, and she just laid there. Um, so that's when we made the decision to move to PAI. Perfect, so what is one of the, essentially a contraindication to CPAP? Uh, unconsciousness. Right, altered mental status. Why? Because she can't move airway. <clears throat> right, you know, we worry about vomiting, and you can imagine vomit to a CPAP mask, and that's going to not turn out well. Probably not for the medic that's going to take it off either. So, but still, prompt CPAP, important, recognizing when it's enough's enough, okay, it's not working. You know, we bring these, but I know we've done case reviews. For every one of these we pull off that we can easily find another nine that turned around. And probably, you know, some of those probably would have turned around on just a non rebreather. But I guarantee a handful of those wouldn't have turned around without the CPAP. So we saved them that ICU stay. <laughs> this lady, how old were they? She was 80. You know, an 80 year old, now on a ventilator in an ICU, her mortality rates to the roof. I don't know if she survived this, but she's probably got a double digit percentage of getting hospital acquired pneumonia, ended up septic, and dying, you know, from that endotracheal tube. But she completely needed it, it was completely appropriate to do. Um, in title CO2, and I, I know I think our service is very good about doing in titles and believing in titles and looking at in titles, those are hugely important. You know, this patient, because you said the CO2 and the blood gas was like 115? Yes, sir. Why do you think she was altered? Because her CO2 is Exactly. So that um, kind of hypercarbic, hyper, um, can make you altered. You know, we see that as you get up to a certain point. There's really not a clear level. You know, most probably if we got to 60, we'd be altered. But if you're a CO2 retainer, you're probably going to have to get three digits before you get the, the uh, before you get like that. Cool, good job. Thanks. I already got a report pulled, and you've been here six weeks. Six weeks. It's not longer than that. Maybe two months. Maybe. Two months, okay. We've got two more weeks on that. Okay, this is my first time to ever PAI somebody, and this was probably one of my first few shifts in FTO, so I'm a brand new, and it was a really good learning experience. Uh, we got called to a nursing home off MLK uh, for Category 9. Uh, I show up, uh, walk into the room, walking to the room, uh, staff advised that the patient was breathing. Um, he was just unconscious, unresponsive. I uh, would get to his bedside, uh, no radials, uh, couldn't get a pressure on him. He was real pale and clammy. Uh, sat in 75% on cannula that they had started on him, the nursing staff. Um, real thick black secretions in his airway. Uh, agonal respirations, probably about six to eight a minute, uh, just gurgling. Uh, so we get him in the truck, throw him on the monitor. Um, he's showing signs at the time. Um, rates about 88, 90. Um, again, it's carotid pulses only, couldn't get radials or uh, anything like that. Still unconscious, unresponsive. Uh, blood pressure red, I think is just above 110 systolic. Uh, that was by NIVP. I couldn't, we couldn't get one. And so we're, we're assisting ventilation at this time uh, by BVM and suctioning. Uh, sat still in the 70s. And so 
it was my call. I, and I had Chad and Donnie with me and then Tim and Les, so they were saying after the call I had about 60 years experience in the back of that truck with me, which was good to have in this, this scenario. Uh, so I, I was I was convinced we should PAI and they all agreed and a Tom Dayton sucks sucks them and then uh, go digging around with the learning scope. Um, the guy didn't weigh that much, he just had a really distended abdomen, but he had a real, real anterior trachea. Um, real hard guy to, to see vocal cords on. And I tried King Vision, tried learning scope, couldn't see anything. And then as I'm digging with the scope and suctioning, he codes. Um, and so our initial pulse was 80, like I said, about 88, 90 um, carotid. And then about three minutes later, I'm just starting to see a drop in pressure, or not pressure, but his pulse. Um, gets down to bradycardic um, below 40, probably about 34, 36. And then they push sucks and sucks lasted for about a minute or so, maybe 30 seconds and he coded. Uh, we ended up um, going protocol and doing uh, passive airway, but being a dirty airway, um, in hindsight, we probably should have tubed him faster. Couldn't get him that first time. And so I passed it off and uh, Les got him tubed with Pretty good difficulty. He, like I said, he's pretty anterior. But he was showing PEA, our first rhythm. Uh, we worked him, gave him the whole book, gave him calcium and uh, sodium and hung dopamine on him. Didn't come out of PEA. We took him in code uh, to UMC. Um, still the whole time suctioning out thick black secretions from his airway um, via 14 French. Uh, uh, got him to the hospital, you know, Doc does his thing with sonogram and the guys in ventricular stand still. Um, so he went from having a, you know, pretty strong carotid at a pretty good rate to going PEA pretty quick after that sucks. Um, but the tube was, tube was difficult, I guess with the, he was already sat in 76% when we got, when we started bagging and increased a little bit, but when we started suctioning, I guess we, we had to suction quite a bit to get that airway cleared out, and I guess that topped off with the sucks. That probably just did him in, and um, he didn't he didn't last much longer after that. He was circling the drain pretty quick. Um, my report was not the best because, well, it's all my first one. Um, yeah, we it just ended up being a respiratory arrest. Um, had a good D stick on him, 110. Um, like I said, we threw the whole book at him and nothing really. I think we gave him six or six or seven epis and a little dopamine, but I guess in the ventricular standstill, it really wasn't going to do much to him. Um, he was just a real, real sick dude. Uh, like I said, the stinted abdomen, we gave him an NG tube. Got pretty good um, waste out of that. Uh, but he just he deteriorated so quickly. And like, uh, First in the room, you know, I said he was, you know, agonal, breathing six to eight a minute. He also had really bad wheezes and rails in his uppers, and he was just, just a really, really sick dude, and he didn't last long after that. All right, thanks. So, yeah, this is a tough first goal. Yeah. First PAIs. So, I don't know why it is, can't explain it, but everybody in here probably, if you done this for a few years and I've seen it in the ER several times you get somebody like this they're kind of bad agonal like that and it's you put them down to intubate them and you just kick them straight into asystole or PEA and you think my gosh did I just do that with my medications I don't think you did you know it just sometimes happens it's the patient needed you know I don't really know exactly what happened to them I wonder with the distended abdomen stuff the person been vomiting may have aspirated is that why we were you know they just aspirated a whole bunch and that's why we were getting all these secretions and stuff maybe that was vomitus maybe a gi bleed if it was dark and had been aspirating um, so you know i think we did absolutely the right thing um, it also kind of a first pai attempt that makes you really appreciate the airway doesn't it Definitely. and you know probably the next 15 or 20 will go pretty good and you'll be like yeah i got this and then you'll get another one of these you know every once in a while that airway kind of puts all of us into our place. They can be very simple, very easy, but they can be a booger bear. 
I guess before the PEI, we gave him we gave him Narcan. Uh, just tried that. Tried it, but I kind of suspected it wasn't going to be effective. And yeah, the nursing staff had said he'd been breathing like this for most of the night. Yeah. So we knew he was in extremely bad shape. Why they had waited this long, we weren't really sure, but. <coughs> Wow. Yeah. And you're probably right, you know, if I armchair quarterback it, you know, maybe. Because how long did we do passive oxygenation? Was it very long or? No, not really. Because, you know, remember, uh, we, the, we spent more time suctioning. Just, just jump. jump. We ended, I think we ended up getting 700 total wow. between it and the NG2. It was, it was black. It was I, I've never seen yeah. black before. So it was black, black. Thick. You will see some more. <laughs> yeah. Right? You will see a lot more. You'll probably wear it at some point, too. That's when you get your real badge. Yeah. So, you know, do remember, though, dirty airway. We want to, you know, we do want to get that airway and try to get it established. And we were working on it. I think all in all, we gave them five a chance. Okay. But Questions, comments? Chad, you, uh, we didn't get the ECG on this one, did we? We did not. You know, when we we were sitting there on this call with uh with him uh i was at the monitor so i was i was sitting right there watching the watching the monitor the whole time and watching chad try to intubate six times but anyways uh i thought it was pretty interesting uh when, when i was watching his rhythm i mean his t waves you could see him just start climbing i mean he his t waves just got really peaked out, you know. I thought to myself, well, there's that possible that potassium ship we just put him in with the sucks. It was right after the sucks, and we talked about it. And Kim and I, and Chad, uh, sat down and looked at the ECG on that guy and saw the where you could see the change. And it wasn't long after that is when he he was done. And uh, so that's my point on that was when you PAI somebody. Uh, you know, have somebody not only watching your SPO2, but watch that rhythm as well. See if you see changes in in your rhythm that you know may be beneficial for the ER doc whenever y'all get there. Because that's the first time I've ever noticed it. It's because Donnie didn't have nothing else to do besides so watch the monitor. So. I was documenting. It's the safest spot for There's these wave things on there. Yeah, there's wave things. <laughs> All right, guys, this is, this is just to reiterate, guys, it's not always going to go well. Sometimes once we take there, you know, you drop that, that sympathetic response that that patient has that normal, that normal drive that they normally have, and that's what's keeping him alive at that point. You take that away, get ready, your hands are going to be full, but our hands were tied. We, we, the, the risk was uh, was minimal compared to the benefit we were going to have for ventilating him. Obviously, it, that the, the result was... Uh, was cardiac arrest, but that's that's going to be from time to time. Also, you know, we talk about respect to airway. You know, there's airways that are be clusters in the field. There's airways that are cluster in the level one trauma center. I've seen it. I've been involved with them. Sometimes it just goes that way. Unfortunately, it's just part of medicine. Not every one of, not every single intubation is going to go perfect and smoothly. There's going to be these, and you try to you probably beat yourself down over that. You know, don't. It's going to happen. Uh, the next seven of them are like that, then we might have to talk. Yeah, he wasn't the You'll easiest, be right. easiest tube to get. So yeah, yeah he, wasn't. he wasn't. So easy. that's that happens as part of it, <laughs> part of this game. If anybody does say, I've got 100% intubation, right? Give them time. They just yeah. didn't work long enough. <laughs> <laughs>